don't know when was the last time I came for a Tampanese or rather this preaching program. Smita Mataji and Sachin Prabhu, thank you very much for having us over. <coughs> Somehow I wanted to meet you both at some point, you know. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You have been so sincere in the practice of Krishna consciousness. So we're very happy that we have an opportunity to come. Come, come. So we chant Jai Radha Madhava and then after that we can uh, read a very nice, very practical verse from Bhagavad Gita. Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jai Radha Madhava
भगवते वासुदेवाय Association. Samachara. Samachara. Do perfectly. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada Ki. Please repeat the translation. Work done, Work done as a sacrifice, as a sacrifice for, Vishnu. for Vishnu has to be performed. Has to be performed. Otherwise, Otherwise, work causes bondage, work causes bondage in, this material world. in this material world. Therefore, Therefore O son of Kunti, o son of Kunti perform, your prescribed duties perform your prescribed duties for his satisfaction. For his satisfaction. And in that way, in that way you, will you will always remain free from bondage. From bondage. Please hear the purport. Since one has to work even for the simple maintenance of the body, the prescribed duties for a particular social position and quality are so made that purpose can be fulfilled. 
Yajna means Lord Vishnu or sacrificial performances. All sacrificial performances also are meant for the satisfaction of Lord Vishnu. The Vedas enjoin Yajnu Vai Vishnu. In other words, the same purpose is served whether one performs prescribed yajnas or directly serves Lord Vishnu. Krishna consciousness is therefore a performance of yajna as it is prescribed in this verse. The Varnashrama institution also aims at satisfying Lord Vishnu. Varnashrama Charavata Purushena Paraha Uman Vishnu Aradhyate Vishnu Puran 388 Therefore, one has to work for the satisfaction of Vishnu. Any other work done in this material world will be a cause of bondage. For both good and evil work have their reactions. And any reactions binds the performer. Therefore, one has to work in Krishna consciousness to satisfy Krishna or Vishnu. And while performing such activities, one is in a liberated stage. This is the great art of doing work. And in the beginning, this process requires very expert guidance. One should therefore act very diligently under the expert guidance of the devotee of Lord Krishna or under the direct instruction of Lord Krishna himself, under whom Arjuna had the opportunity to work. Nothing should be performed for sense gratification, but everything should be done for the satisfaction of Krishna. This practice will not only save one from the reaction of work, but also gradually elevate one to transcendental loving service of the Lord, which alone can raise one to the kingdom of God. Jai Prabhupada's Transcendental Purpose Ki Jai. Om Agnana Timirandasya Jnana Jana Shalakaya Chakshirun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venama Sri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Kadati Swapadamatikam Vandeha Shri Guru Shri Tapada Pramanam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupa Sarajatam Sahagana Ramnatham Vitam Tam Sajiva Sarvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sajitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Pada Sahagana Radhita Shri Vishakar Vitamscha E Krishna Karana Sindho Vira Bandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tatta Kanchana Gauranvile Radhe Vrita Anishwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamani Hari Priye Vancha Kalpitra Pumyascha Krapaha Sindhu Vyaye Vacha Padithanam Pahanebhyo, Vaishnavebhyo, Namo Namaha Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Vidahara, Shri Vasa Nigora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama So Hare Krishna. So today's verse is actually very practical because it speaks about how we should perform work. We all understand that actually nobody can remain inactive. Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra decided that he will actually not fight. So when he said he will not fight, he actually meant that he will retire from Kshatriya duties. Arjuna did not want to fight because he felt that he could not understand the purpose of why he was fighting. It was only after Krishna instructed and informed him that there is a higher purpose to his duty, then Arjuna became convinced. The deeper meaning to this point is that Arjuna became convinced to fight because Krishna said that it would please him if he were to fight. Yes. So this is very important. 
work that is done for the satisfaction of Krishna, that work that is performed, it has one effect. It frees us from the law of karma. You all have heard of the law of karma. You know that every action has a reaction. And you know for every particular action that we have, whether it is good or whether it is bad, there will always be a reaction. And sometimes we don't realize that just one action of ours can cause ripples and ripples and ripples of consequences. It's amazing. For example, if, uh, if, if uh, for example, yeah, Sachin Prabhu. If Sachin Prabhu, our host, got very upset with me at some point, and he comes up to me and he slaps me across the face, he won't do it, of course. He's a gentleman. But if he gets tired of me and I'm stalking and talking and it's 10 o'clock and you're all very hungry because Prasadam is there and I'm the only one not feeling hungry, he, he may do that. And when he does that, he slaps me now. A few things happens after that action. The first action that will happen is that if I want to be very difficult with him, I will file a police case with him. In Singapore, if you slap someone, that's considered assault. If you're a first timer, you get two weeks jail. That's the market rate. <laughs> In the legal field, that's what we call it. Right? We call it market rate. That's the market rate. Two weeks for first timers. So once he goes in and he comes out, then I will file a civil suit against Sachin Prabhu. That means I want damages from him. So I sue him in a civil court. And I'll use the proceedings in the criminal court to easily convict him. Now, supposing I was in America, because in America everything is possible. <laughs> it's the only country in the world where anything is possible. In America, I would then go and see a psychiatrist. And I would get a psychiatric report. In that report, I will say that the slap that Sachin Prabhu gave me has traumatized me so much that I can never appear before an audience. Every time I sit down to take class, what happens is I see Sachin Prabhu in front of me. <laughs> so when I'm at home and I'm going to sleep, I see him in front of me. I have to appear before court in front of the judge and I see him in front of me about to slap me. So I'm totally traumatized. So I get a psychiatric specialist report and the specialist is of the expert medical opinion that uh, that um, I am so traumatized that I will now, I cannot work from maybe the next six months. I can't give classes for the next six months. Classes, nobody pays me. So there's no loss of earnings. You know, nobody's going to pay me and I'm quite happy with it. But I will tell the court that, look, I've got six months to appear before court and I'm not going to do it. So therefore, all my future earnings and all my future clients, I will lose. So such a problem has to pay for all that. Now, at the end of all that action, all this reaction came from just one happening. Today he came and he slapped me. That was it. And what about the reaction to all this on him? After all this, if I was Sachin Prabhu, I'll end up seeing a psychiatrist. Because I'll be traumatized by the whole episode myself. All this happened only because of one action. But we don't see the effects it happens. This is the law of karma. And we don't realize that every single thing that's happening to us is a result of a reaction that has gone round and round and round and round and is eventually coming back to us. The unfairest statement in the world to make is the fact that the world is an unfair place. Because the stringent laws of material nature are such that anything that comes to us has a way of coming back to us. That is why when we find good things happening to us, we realize that something in the past, by Krishna's mercy, has been right. But when things go wrong, Bhagavatam tells us, instead of blaming the whole world except ourselves, it is better to look to ourselves. This Bhagavatam calls self-introspection. It's a very important thing that we should do. As your children grow up, teach them this value of not blaming the whole world, but looking to themselves and understanding that where there is smoke, there must be fire. A person who does that, he understands the potency of activity. That is why the word karmana, the root of karmana is karma. There will always be an action, Prabhu's advantages to whatever you do. And it doesn't matter whether it is in this life or whether it is in the past life. In the Padma Purana, there is a very interesting uh, episode. A young boy who is from a Brahmanical background, is going around begging alms in a village. He passes by a young lady 
and an elderly man. This young lady is married to the elderly man because he's very rich and he has many wives and she's one of them. When he goes out, the young man goes in to ask for alms, as was tradition. The lady calls him in and then suddenly she tells him that I want to run away with you because I'm not satisfied with my husband. So the man says, Mataji, I'm just a brahmachari. I, I'm not going to do that. I'm just here to beg for arms and I'm going to spend time in my sadhana. But what happens is that the lady says, if you don't accede to my request, then I'm going to sound off the village. And in the village, between you and me, they will hear me. They will not hear you. He says, no, I will not tell, I will not say anything and not do anything that is wrong. So the lady sounds the alarm. And she tells everyone and falsely accuses him of misbehaving with her. And the chiefs of the village come together and they say, which hand did he use to actually put himself on you? And she said, he used his right hand to touch me. And immediately ch they chopped off his right hand. Many, many years later, the brahmachari grows older and he leaves his body. He appears before the superintendent of death, Yamaraj. And he asks, why was I given that terrible um, punishment to myself? Why is it that that happened to me? And Yamaraj says that in your previous life, you were a very nice person, a very good devotee, and you took a vow that you will only tell the truth. So one day what happened was, you were sitting in your hermitage, and one man, you know, ran past you, and he said, thieves are chasing after me. Please help me, please help me. And he ran away. And a few minutes later, some thieves really passed by. And they stopped and they asked this, this, uh, this person who was sitting down. They asked him, Sir, you look like a holy man and surely you are sworn to tell the truth. And he said, Yes, I am. Did you see a gentleman passing by, shouting and claiming that thieves are chasing after him? I, we need to find that person. So immediately this man came to know that these were the thieves who were chasing after that man. It's a question of whether he tells the truth and points in the right direction. Or he understands that there is a higher truth to saving this man's life because obviously he's going to get killed. But the man says, I'm a lover of truth. So he uses his right hand and he points in the direction of where this man has gone. And Yamaraj said, that man died because of your immature understanding of what truth is. And you used your right hand to point to the death of the man. And so in this life, though it looked entirely unfair that you should lose your hand, now do you understand the whole perspective of where you have come from and where you will go? So there are many episodes like this that are given in our Sashtras to explain to us that we are accountable for our actions. That's the main point. And that is what Krishna is telling here. He's saying that work or action has to be performed. This is very clear. And he's saying this to Arjuna because Arjuna was thinking, let me become Sadhu Baba. Let me go to the cave and retire and I will be very peaceful. No <coughs> war, nothing on my head. But what, what, what would have been the consequence? The karma on his head would have been the greatest if he did not fight the war and Duryodhan and gang became the new rulers. Can you imagine the kind of karma that would come on a warrior who could have stopped that war but did not do so? It's terrible. So Krishna is our well-wisher. And Krishna wanted Arjuna to do the right thing. And the right thing in Bhagavad Gita equals to what Krishna wants. That is why when we say that we do something, we cannot stop doing it. Arjuna tells, you know, in 1857, 58, 59, 60, I think those four verses, very important verses in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna tells Arjuna, and this is very nice because he's using logic. All of us grew up on logic and sometimes we resist spiritual life. Because spiritual life doesn't sound all that logical. And we think, wait a minute, no, I came through schooling, I've got all my degrees, and here we are talking about things that we cannot prove. So sometimes in our generation, we become a little bit difficult when it comes to things that appear illogical. But here, in the next four verses, you will find, anyone has Bhagavad Gita with them? Mataji, you have it, right? You turn to 1857. Because these four verses will tell us how logical Krishna is. And you cannot refute his logic. He says firstly in the first verse, Chetasaha Sarva Karmani, Mayi Sanyasa Matparaha, Buddhi Yoga Mupasrittaha, Mat Chitta Sakatham Bhava. Mataji, can you read to me the translation? 
loudly. In all activities, just depend upon me and work always under my protection. In all activities, this is Arjuna being told by Krishna, and this is the essence of the verse. He says, in all your activities, very important. That means whatever activity we do. We do not differentiate between a material activity and a spiritual activity in Krishna consciousness. Arjuna, <clears throat> Arjuna was going to perform a battle, fight. A fight looks essentially like a material activity, and it is. But then, Krishna says, in all activities, depend on me. Isn't it, Mataji? Depend on me. This is the essence of working. When we work today, everywhere, who are we depending on? Very often we depend on our own capacities and our own capabilities. But you and I know, you've lived at least, most of you have lived for more than 30 years. You will know that in life, just on your own capacity and capability is not going to always ensure peace, bliss and happiness. You all know by now so many things are beyond your control. Tomorrow the economy goes down, that's the end of your job. Tomorrow the economy goes up, it's boom time. There are so many things that we think we have control over. We can't even control our blood pressure. Can't control the heartbeat. We cannot control our diabetes. We have no idea whether our heart is blocked or not until we knock off and die. That's the only time we know. Very often we don't even know if we have terrible diseases growing us in us until we understand it's stage 3, stage 4, it's over. What are we controlling? Every day you read in the newspaper of people who are walking by somewhere, someone hits them and there they go. So we have come to a point where we understand that depending only on ourselves is not the ultimate truth and the ultimate solution. So Krishna says, Arjuna, you depend on me in all your activities, particularly now in your fight. So the next, tomorrow when we go to work, we should remember one thing. Though we have the expertise to do our work, expertise doesn't always equal or equate to success. You may have someone more political than you with very little expertise. He knows which buttons to press. <laughs> And he's always doing better and you're always cringing and thinking, why isn't there justice in the world? Isn't it? So Krishna says, instead of depending on the boss, some of us take so much care of the boss, we do arati for the boss every day, we serve the boss so nicely as if he's the supreme personality of Godhead. But at the end of the day, when the boss says, well, you know, you don't fit into our scheme of times, and you know, the polite word for you to leave is actually, look, we are restructuring, isn't it? <laughs> right? That's a very polite, diplomatic way of saying you are no longer relevant. I do, I do a fair bit of family law, and sometimes when husbands and wives fight and they want to come and divorce, one husband was really smart, he told me, it's not really a divorce, it's just restructuring my family life. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's just come to a point where I have to restructure my family life. And we realize that we're depending on all the wrong persons. You get married, you depend on your husband for happiness. Mataji's, I don't have to tell you what is your success rate. <laughs> I look at the Prabhus and you think after marriage, it's all going to be honeymoon period. But you all know that it's not always honeymoon. There are days when, you know, it's not even a moon. There's no honey, there's nothing. That's up and down of life. But you will realize the golden rule in this world. You depend on anything except that which is eternal and everlasting. Then you will know that whatever you depend on, because by nature that which you depend is per impermanent and temporary, therefore the happiness that flows with it must be also impermanent and temporary. If that is not logic, then I really don't know what else is. If you flow with something which is permanent, then it doesn't always give you permanence. And one thing we do know is that the existence of the Supreme is eternal. All religions, all faiths agree on that. It's very straightforward. So Krishna is telling Arjuna, you can be anything you want, but right now you're a warrior. So do one thing, depend on me. And then Mataji, what does he say? And work always under my protection. Work always under my protection. How do you work under Krishna's protection? Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam tells us the secret to be protected by Krishna is actually to follow his instructions. If I came up to you and said, what would satisfy you? You would probably say, what would really satisfy me is if you hear what I have to say. Everyone wants to be heard. 
if you say what will really satisfy someone, then they will tell you these are the things that will satisfy me. And if you say, so if I do these things, you will be satisfied, they will say, yes, if you do these things, I'll be satisfied. And what's the, what's the preemptive point behind it? You do all these things and they become satisfied, therefore you are following what they want you to do. Every father, mother, when we scold our children or we tell them, don't do this, don't do that, the reason we tell them that is because we know it will make them happy. But we become happier if they follow our instructions because we know that we are their well wishes. Krishna is the Supreme Father. He knows what is better for us because He created us. How many times our parents told us, I know what is better for you, and when we were young, we said, ah, they don't know what is, they're all outdated people, you know. And now our children are telling us that, isn't it? We don't know how to switch on that smart TV, we don't know what to do with a tablet, we don't know what to do with something, and they come and just touch something and they can do everything. And you realize after a while you're becoming obsolete. And they think that they know everything. Every generation makes this policy. And this is the same problem that Arjuna was faced with. And that is why Krishna told him, you depend on me first. So if we want to satisfy Krishna, then we don't have to leave our work. We can do our work. If you are the housewife, be the best housewife you can be. If you are a manager, if you are a lawyer, if you are a doctor, be the best doctor, lawyer you can be. The only difference is who is your employer? Who do you want to satisfy? 90% of the time we put pictures of loved ones on our table because that's the only thing that gets us through the day with our boss, isn't it? Just looking at them, I think, oh, I can tolerate this fellow because I'm working for my children. If not, we can't tolerate it. But Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita tells us the only difference in consciousness is instead of depending on everything else except Krishna, we depend on Krishna. And once you depend on Krishna, like watering the root of a tree, everything else falls in place. Everything else falls in place. So work has to be performed. Devotees are not shirkers. We are workers. We don't shirk our responsibility. The word to describe a Vaishnava in Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam is Daksha. Daksha in Sanskrit means expert. Whatever you take up, do it to the best that you can do. But do it in this mood. Depend on Krishna's mercy. Know, be humble, that not everything is within your domain. That there are many things outside of your domain. Arjuna thought he was a great warrior. That's why in Bhagavad Gita he is known as Savyasachi. Savyasachi means one who can shoot arrows very expertly. But in 11.33 of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells him, Arjuna, Tvamutishta, you please get up now and you enjoy your kingdom because it is your right as Kshatriya. But remember one thing, Mayai Vaite Nihata Purvam Eva Nimitta Matra Bhavya Savya Sachin Just know that all who have to die on the battlefield, they are already dead by my arrangement. So the question Arjuna can ask is, Krishna, if you have arranged everything, then what is my role? What role am I doing? Krishna gives the, the answer at the last line. Nimitta matra. You become an instrument in my hands. You know the beauty of becoming an instrument? Nobody sues you. I'll tell you that. If you are a knife in the hand of a surgeon, the surgeon cuts the patient wrongly, the surgeon is sued. Nobody sues the knife. If you are a knife in the hand of a thief and the thief stabs you, nobody sentences the knife to, in court. They only sentence the thief. So Krishna was telling us that if we want to live peacefully in this world, become an instrument in his hand. And you will not be held accountable because Krishna's mercy protects your accountability. Very important point. Krishna's mercy protects our accountability. Otherwise, we are accountable to every single action in this world. But Krishna says, what is that? Uh, Matri, can you end the verse so that we can understand the verse? In such devotional service, in such devotional service, be fully conscious of me. Be fully conscious of me. This is the secret of work. In all these activities, be conscious who you're working for, who you want to offer the results to, who do you want to be inspired by. If you feel that you are working for Krishna, then your work is no longer mundane. It assumes so much more deeper a purpose. Why? Because the results of that work are no longer touched by karma. Krishna is above Kala and he is above karma. He is above gunas because he created this material world. He is completely spirit. Which means then 
that if we are connected to Krishna, then the essence of us, which is spiritual, is fully blossomed. So even though we are exposed to the law of karma, Krishna guarantees here, and this is the second verse now. Huh? Second verse is very nice. Mat chitta sarva durgani, mat prasada tarisyasi, atha chitvam ahankaram nashoyasi vinamshasi. Sri Lakshmi Mataji, you can read the verse. This verse is very nice. Translation. Translation. If you become conscious of me. If you become conscious of me. So he said in the first verse, you depend on me. And when you depend on me, you become conscious of me. Have you realized how when you depend on the love of someone, you're always conscious of that person? When you get married to someone or you're in love with someone, you don't realize that the, the feelings of love you have on that person actually grows into a form of dependence. For right or for wrong, it doesn't matter. But the concept is it's still dependence. That's why parents get hurt when our children hurt us by saying maybe harsh things or not obeying us. It's not because we are control freaks, but it's because we have love for them. And those whom you love, you normally either get hit very badly or you get very happy for a while and then get hit badly anyway. That is that is the nature of the world. So she, he says now, uh, what what does he say? Um, what's, what's, yes, if you become conscious of me, you will pass, um, you will pass over all the obstacles. You will of, pass over all obstacles of conditioned life. Of conditioned life. By my grace. By my grace. These are the obstacles that work attracts. Work that is not done for Krishna. Anyatra. Anyatra means otherwise. If you do not do work for Krishna, then Machitta Sarva Durgani. Durgani means obstacles. Right, Mataji? In the word to word? Impediments. impediments. Durgani in Sanskrit is translated as, as impediments. Sometimes people say devotees also have impediments. In fact, devotees have so many impediments. So what is Krishna saying? What Krishna is saying is the impediments don't go away. But Krishna's mercy gives the devotees the strength to cross over the impediments. So for the devotee, that doesn't become an impediment. It becomes an opportunity. What appears like a threat to your life becomes an opportunity for a devotee. So if a devotee has no job and he's unemployed, he's feeling very bad, so is a person who is a non-devotee. A non-devotee will move around and try very hard to get a job. So will the devotee. He will work very hard to try to get a job. But he's peaceful because he says, Krishna, I will chant, I will perform my devotional service, and I will depend on you. And I will try my best. But I leave it to you, my Lord. At the right time, I have faith that the right job will come. And whatever that comes, if it's a challenge, I know it is meant to increase my faith. For the atheists, I tell even those who don't believe in God, I tell them that even if you did not believe in God, such a thinking minus God is still positive. <laughs> it's still positive. Even the atheist has to admit, you know what, even if you minus Krishna from the equation, it's still positive energy. You don't get bogged down by negativity. That's the beauty of the Gita. The Gita is so amazing that Krishna is so powerful and so embedded in the Gita that even if you think you can remove him, you can't. Because all that is positive in this world is actually Krishna. The atheist doesn't realize that, but the devotee realizes it. So you see, whatever obstacles that come, Krishna makes it clear, by my grace, you can cross over them. He doesn't say, by my grace, they go away. He says, by my grace, you can cross over. There's a difference. Crossing over means you must be crossing over something, isn't it? If it's not there, then why should you cross over? So obviously impediments are there. But the devotees become stronger. The materialists become more discouraged. That's the difference. And now what does he say at the end of the two lines? If, however, you do not work in such consciousness... If, however, you don't work in such consciousness, anyatra, if you don't work in such consciousness, now what happens? But act through false people. But you act through false ego. And what is this false ego? This false ego is present in all of us. This false ego simply says, I am this body. And I am everything. In other words, the world starts with me, it ends with me, and in between, it's all me. That's false ego. When we have false ego, we become the center of our universe. We think of everything in relation to us. Again, even if you're an atheist, 
you will not like a person who is falsely egotistical because they are very selfish. Everything is according to what benefits me. That is the ultimate symptom of false ego. But the world doesn't revolve just around one person, Prabhu and Mahapajis. It actually revolves around the Supreme Personality of Godhead because He created the world. When devotees live their lives and perform activities in such a way that they put Krishna in the center of that world, then they become conscious of Krishna. Then they become dependent on Krishna. And then by Krishna's mercy, they are protected by Krishna. And when they are protected, the last element of Krishna consciousness comes into being. They become directed by Krishna. So Krishna is known in Bhagavad Gita as Rishikesha. Rishikesha means master of the senses. We all have senses. The problem is we think we master our senses. But we don't realize the senses very often master us. For example, if I continue this class too long, your sense of hunger will start growing. Right? And once it starts growing, all your other senses will become undermined. Have you noticed how when one particular sense becomes very strong, you find it's very hard to control your urges. Very difficult. Very, very difficult. You try talking to someone who's fasting the whole day, that person, if he's not really in self-control, will be very moody, you know? They'll be very snappy and very grumpy. So the senses are very difficult to control. And when we think we can control the senses, that's the time the senses control us. Alexander the Great was conquering half of India at that moment. It was the only continent in that area that he had not conquered. So he walked into India. And at one point of time, history tells us that he met this very saintly personality sitting under a tree. And Alexander was very attracted to the personality. Because he said, this personality has no gold, no jewels, nothing. But he looks completely serene. So he told him then, he asked him this question. Why is it that you are so peaceful? And the, and the saintly person, he said, I am very peaceful because I have accepted that I am nothing. And Alexander said, well, you are nothing, but I am everything. So you are right. You are nothing, but I am everything. And the saintly person laughed. So Alexander got angry. He said, how can you laugh? The saintly person said, I am nothing. Why should nothing be something to you? <laughs> why should nothing be something to you? He said, no, now it has become something to me. You tell me why you are laughing. And he said, I will not tell you. There is nothing. I am nothing. So just walk away, Alexander, whoever you are. He said, no, now you must tell me. And the saintly person said, I'm just laughing because here you said that you are something and I accept that I'm nothing. But the moment I laughed, you wanted to understand why I laughed. And when you could not understand it, you could not control your senses. And now you cannot control your anger with me. And I'm just thinking that you may be the richest and most greatest man on earth, but now I realize why I cannot take anything from you because you don't own anything. Because you can't control anything. Golden rule. That which you own is that which you must be able to control. If you cannot control something, how can you claim ownership over it? If you cannot control the vestiges of your body, how can you claim control over the body? This is logic. If you cannot control your temper, how can you claim control over the senses? So actually, in this material world, we cannot control ourselves. We think we can. We sometimes can, sometimes cannot. To think that we have total control is a fallacy. So when we accept that all the senses, especially the master sense, which is the mind, the mind can only be controlled when it is engaged in devotional service. And that is why work has to be performed for the satisfaction of Krishna. When you perform an activity that satisfies Krishna, when Krishna becomes satisfied, the entire activity becomes transcendental. Transcendental means it carries you above the gunas. It carries you above karma. And it carries you above karma. Time doesn't affect devotional service. It does not. Devotees may be very old, but Krishna always allows them to remember him. We know of an actual case of a devotee. She's white-bodied. She's a westerner who adopted this wonderful science of devotional service. She passed away maybe two years ago. She spent an entire 20, 30 years of her late life serving the deities in a temple in Atlanta, in US. And towards the end of her life, her age, she became struck with dementia. 
Do you know how wide ranging dementia is today? It's, it's, it's so wide ranging and it's so sad. It's better that the body is ravaged than even the mind. Because once you don't know who are the people around you, the consciousness is gone. But this devotee actually got dementia and the devotees who knew her became very sad. Because they thought that if dementia is there, she'll forget Krishna. So what happened was she got dementia. But after a while they realized one thing, she forgot everything. The only thing she kept remembering is, I have not completed chanting the holy names of the Lord. That's all she kept saying. So whenever she chanted 16 rounds of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare, after chanting a required number of rounds, she would stop and tell the devotees, I have not completed my rounds. That meant that she would have the opportunity to chant again. See the mercy of Krishna. Krishna kept making her forget that she had chanted so that she could continuously chant. And she just kept chanting until she left the body. And she did it not because anyone chased her. Every day she said, I have not completed my rounds. Every two hours I have not completed my rounds. She was just chanting Krishna's names. So this proves that when you try to satisfy Krishna, in whatever dangerous or difficult or challenging situation you may be, in that situation if you depend on Him, Krishna by His grace, Mat Prasada Tarisyasi, He will help you cross over this difficult ocean of birth. And not only will he do that, Prabhu and Matajis, he says that if you just depend on your false ego, and you don't depend and understand that we are meant to also understand what should please Krishna, then what happens is we will be lost. So what Arjuna was being told by Krishna is, you want to become sadhu, you can go and become sadhu. But what will happen is, your nature is Kshatriya. Have you noticed how we all have certain natures? Even if you hang us upside down and try to reform us, the nature still comes out. It has a way of coming back, isn't it? I've always noticed how husbands and wives, before they get married, they always tell each other, I accept you for who you are. And 90% of the time, that's the reason why we get married to them, isn't it? Oh, he accepts me as who I am. It's the ultimate expression of love. After the marriage crosses, right, you realize both husband and wife take it upon themselves as a single-minded task to change the other partner to become what they want them to be. It always happens and halfway through people say, but I thought you liked me the way I was, you know, and now you're saying you want me to be this, this, that, that. So my point is, all of us have our natures and it's very difficult to change the nature. Krishna says in the third chapter, I think we'll come to that in 33rd verse. Krishna says that even a man of great knowledge cannot change his nature. So Bhagavad Gita's point is don't suppress your nature. Beautiful point. Don't suppress your nature. If your nature is you love to cook, Cook for Krishna, right? Offer the, the food so that it becomes prasad for Krishna. In that way, it's a double dose. You like to eat, very good. Then you let Krishna eat first and then you gobble up. At least something is there. You're getting prasad. Maybe someone loves to make money. Good, it's your nature to make money. Make money. But every amount that you make, you put aside something and give it to Krishna. Use it in his service. Some people say, how is it that if I give a certain amount, everything becomes prasad? How is it that everything can become prasad? But the science is very simple. When you offer prasad, those of you who are offering, you will know. When you have cooked rice, after cooking rice, you take a small pot, isn't it? And then you put all the small little bit of each. You take a bit of rice and you put it in it, and then you offer it to Krishna. And when you offer it to Krishna, after Krishna has accepted it, then you put that little bit into the whole pot. And the whole pot is taken as prasad. The whole pot is taken as prasad. So Krishna doesn't want 100% of your salary. Use 10%, 20%, but use it in his service. Now, we are in Melville Park. Prabhu and Mataji are obviously paying amounts for the house. But today, they have used the house for the glorification of Krishna. This means that today, right now, where we are, according to the purport, None of us are touched by the law of karma, at least from 7.45 till the time you take prasadam and leave the house. After that, that's up to you. It's between you and Krishna. You keep chanting, if you take up this process, you minimize karma. But right now, we are all in transcendental platform. That is why you'll notice, nobody's sleeping. It's Friday, long week. Nobody looks unalert. Everyone is very peaceful. 
We don't know why we are peaceful, but we're peaceful. It's all right. We've sat down for almost 50 minutes, but we're all right. We're not so bad. Because the message is transcendental. Even if the speaker is not transcendental, the message of the Gita is transcendental. If I don't have the potency, but I give you fire, fire will burn, whether it is touching something which is not burning or not. It will burn. This is the message of the Gita. So to conclude, very important point. Krishna tells us, if you want to be peaceful in this world, if you want to be happy in this world, then the most important thing we should do is we must accept that we cannot be without activity. First, always be active. <coughs> Second, plan your life in such a way that your activities have Krishna in the center. Very important point. If you can somehow plan your life in such a way that Krishna is in the center, then you will find that in that lifestyle, less and less of the effect of the work and the karmas of the world are on you. Some people ask me, how will I know if I'm not being affected by the law of karma? The answer is very simple. You will know that because as you continue with devotional service, you'll find that despite the challenges of life, you're able to be peaceful, blissful, and you're able to face the difficulties with faith. This is the litmus test that you are safely under the lotus feet and the lotus shade of the Supreme Lord. So satisfy Krishna. In other words, you need to know what Krishna likes. That's the key. How will we know what Krishna likes? We will only know what someone likes if you get to know the person. Isn't it true? You'll only know what he likes or she likes if you get to know someone. You know, in arranged marriages, what you have, two people sit down, what do you like, what do you like, what do you like, what do you like, right? If you don't like the person, you tell him all the things that you think he doesn't like. Then you never get married to him. In that way, we also have to know what Krishna likes. Sometimes people ask, how do you know Prabhu or Mataji what Krishna likes? And we tell them, it's very simple. It's in the Gita. Krishna's instructions in the Gita and Bhagavatam are what pleases him. So if Krishna tells us you be engaged, you depend on me, you be conscious of me, then that's what we should do. It's not very difficult to satisfy Krishna. Krishna becomes satisfied very easily, but he loves it when you follow his instructions. I'll end by telling you one very short story, two minutes, but it's very instructive. You all know the Devatas, right? And you all know the Asuras, right? Now the Asuras and the Devatas, the only difference between them is the Devatas are devotees of the Lord. And they have faith. Every time they are in difficulty in Swarga Loka, they will petition Krishna. And the Asuras, very powerful, but they never have faith in Krishna. They only have faith in themselves. So what happened was, one time the Asuras were very powerful. This is in the 8th canto of Bhagavatam. And because they became so powerful, and because somehow or another they got the blessings of their Guru Sukracharya, they became rulers of Swargaloka. So Indra and all the Devatas became very perturbed. And they with Brahma went to see Lord Vishnu. And Lord Vishnu gave them very nice instruction. He told them, you must declare a truce with the demons. You're not strong enough. You declare a truce. You tell the king of the demons, Bali. At that time it was Bali. Tell him that together we will churn the ocean of milk. And when we churn the ocean of milk, you will get Amrit. When you get Amrit, many things will come out from the ocean, by the way. When all these things come out of the ocean, I want you all to do one thing. Do not be distracted by them. Do not be distracted. And when Amrit comes also, the demons will jump on it. And even at that point of time, I tell you, be patient, be persevering. Be patient and be persevering. Very important. When you're patient and you have perseverance, then everything can be possible. And Krishna gave them nice advice. In anger and agitation, nothing can be done. When you perform work for the satisfaction of Krishna, you'll always realize that Krishna gives you the strength to be patient and to persevere. Every time you depend on yourself, you will find anger and agitation always takes work. It's a very easy thing. 
You get angry and agitated, you know you're not depending on Krishna. But if you're depending on Krishna and chanting Krishna's names, you will become patient, you will persevere. So, the devatas had only these two instructions. The question was, if they followed it, Krishna would become peaceful and happy and satisfied. So, they met Bali Maharaj, shook hands. Bali Maharaj thought, what's the harm? You know, if we both churn, Amrit will come. And we know we are stronger than them. We will say yes to them. Now when Amrit comes, we will jump on the Amrit and they will not have anything. So they were powerful and they thought, this is our plan. This is how we are without Krishna. We plan so many things. But we don't realize that there's always someone else planning something else. So the demons and, um, and the devatas, to cut a long story short, they started churning. They brought Mount Mandara, a very powerful mountain. They brought it across the plains. Somehow or another, with Krishna's help, they go into the ocean. And in the ocean, they start churning. They start churning Mount Mandara using Vasuki, which is the king of the serpents. So, uh, the devatas were on the tail side of Vasuki. Originally supposed to be on the front, but the demons protested. So, they got the tail side. The demons got the front side, thinking that they were very smart. So, eventually what happened was, as they started churning, they found that there was no fulcrum. There was no base for Mount Mandara. You can, you can only keep something up afloat if your churning is very fast. You keep an object afloat. But they were not strong. So, Mount Mandara started sinking. So as, they, as Mount Mandara started sinking, the demons didn't know what to do because demons don't pray. When they have difficulty, they don't pray. Ah, okay, so now what to do? That's it. Can you all imagine? You can't because you're devotees. The devatas thought, oh, Mount Mantra is going down. So what did they do? They started praying. They started chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, 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 Krishna Hare, 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 Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Rama. And Krishna came in the beautiful form of Kurma, the tortoise. And Bhagavatam says this tortoise was 800,000 miles long. Because imagine the base of Mount Mandra. The Lord was 800,000 miles long. And when the Lord went under, He just gently lifted the fulcrum of a, a very immensely heavy mountain. And Bhagavatam said as He lifted it, it felt like feather to Him. And as they started churning it, you know when something scratches you at the back, right? Sometimes a scratch is a bit pleasurable, isn't it? You feel a bit pleasurable? And my father, when he has a scratch, he puts his back to the wall and he scratches himself. Have you seen that happen? Some people do that. So Bhagavatam tells us that was the same way Kurma felt. He felt like a pleasant itch on the back as the churning was going on. For the Lord, it's nothing. But the Lord realized even with him there, he could not, he also had to help out the churning because these two groups were very weak. They thought they were very strong. So at the bottom, Kurma, as the Lord, was churning. Then the Lord took a thousand-handed form and sat on top Mount Mandara. And from the top, he also churned. Now, as they churned, Vasuki, you know, was very tired. So he started emitting poisonous fumes. Now, who were the wise people who decided to be standing in front of Vasuki? The demons. And now they were choking like anything. They were choking like anything. And the devatas also were feeling very tired. So Krishna now came in the form of breeze and rain. How many forms has he taken? He took the form of the tortoise. He's taken the form of the thousand arm, arm form at the top. He now comes in the form of fresh rains and breeze. So that there is some freshness to them. And then the last point Bhagavatam says, Krishna entered the heart of Vasuki in the mode, in the guna. In his guna. His guna was the guna of ignorance. So he entered his heart in the form of ignorance to encourage him to continue. He entered into the hearts of the demons in the form of passion because demons are normally passionate. They forget Krishna, they think the goal is just enjoyment and they are passionate about it. So he entered their hearts to just fan their enthusiasm. And he entered the hearts of the devatas in the mode of goodness because they are sattvic by nature. And he also encouraged them. In all these ways Krishna helped. Why did he help everyone? Because the devatas were working for the satisfaction of Krishna. That's all. Yes, they are not pure devotees. They want the Swarga Loka as their aim. But even in a, in a mixed devotional service, they had so much help. Imagine what happens when we do put our heart and soul into Krishna. And who were the beneficiaries, unintended? The demons. The devatas prayed very hard. The demons got nice churning done. This is the great nature of Krishna. When Krishna was in the in Mahabharata, 
Did he deny Duryodhan Sakuni oxygen? Did he deny them nice food? They had the best of opulences. Krishna is so merciful, the demons don't die, you know. In fact, they thrive. That is his mercy. So at the end of the entire thing, as they as they churn and churn and churn, all the different items came. Beautiful apsaras came, a wonderful white horse came, you had beautiful Airavata's uh, relatives, the elephants coming, and each one of them was either taken by the Lord, Lakshmi Devi came, the Lord too, the demons took the apsaras, they took the elephants, and then all of a sudden, as all this was going, the hearts of the Devata started going down and down and down. They thought, all these things are coming, we are not getting anything. But they remembered Krishna. They said, Krishna will be satisfied if we follow his instructions. So they persevered. Sometimes when your boat is on course, but the journey is long, you tend to become discouraged. Am I really reaching the end? But those who have faith, they continue. That's what the Devatas did. And right at the end, a beautiful being came. It was Dandantri. And he held a wonderful golden pot. And the moment the Devatas and the demon saw it, they knew, <gasps> it's Amrit. So the Devatas thought, this is what we fought for. This is what we have worked for. This is the goal. And the demons also thought, this is our goal. So what did they do? They jumped on the Amrit. The moment they jumped on it, they started fighting amongst themselves. No, it's mine. I will hold it. I will hold it. This is the nature of demons. Now the Devatas were thinking, this is what we wanted. And now they will take it. But they all reminded themselves, listen, what did Krishna tell us? Patience and perseverance. That's all. And true enough, because the demons had the pot, they were becoming angry and agitated. Why? Because they thought this was theirs. So they began fighting with each other. Now when Krishna saw the demons, the devatas had passed two tests to his satisfaction. Krishna now took another form in this beautiful pastime. The last form, Mohini. He comes as Mohini Murti. More beautiful than the most beautiful female form in all the three worlds. And the moment the demons see him, they all fall in love with that form. And then when they come, when he comes, in, I mean now he is a she, all the demons surrender the Amrit and say, my most beautiful maiden, we don't know where you have come from, are you married? This is the nature of demons, you know. The moment they see a lady, are you married or you're not? So they ask, are you married? You know, if not, why are you here? I tell you what, we are all fighting with each other. We have lost our senses. You take this and we trust you to take care of everything. Everything. Mohini Murti said, I will do it. You all go and take your bath because Vasuki is all over you. And then after you sit down, Devatas, you also sit down. And then I will distribute it. So the demons thought, I know that they will only, she will only give us. Do you know why they thought that way? Because they thought she's very beautiful. What has beauty got to do with trust? <laughs> but this is how foolish demonic mentality is. They actually say in Bhagavatam, because she is very beautiful, she will only give us our share. What is the meaning of that? <laughs> but this is what happens when you are not devotee. There is no common sense in our heads. In fact, there is no head also. <laughs> so what happened was the demon sat down, the devatas sat down. Mohini Murti starts from the devatas. As she goes down, the demons are getting agitated. But the moment they agitated, she just glances, beautiful glances at them and they say, everything will be fine. <laughs> everything will be fine. Don't worry. There must be a reason for this. There must be a reason for this. By the end of the line, everything is exhausted. Only one demon, that's Rahu, but that's a different story, realizes what has happened. But all the other demons are duped. And the devatas are strong, powerful, and because they are powerful, a great battle ensues on the ocean of milk and they regain Swarga Loka. It's a simple pastime, has many meanings. But the most important meaning for today is the Devatas just try to follow the instruction of Krishna. And because they tried sincerely, Krishna became satisfied with them. And because they became, he became satisfied with them, whatever efforts that they did there did not become a material effort like the demons. It actually helped them. And Krishna is so kind, Ananyas chintayantumam ye janaha paripasate nityam, no, uh, what is that? Tesham nitya abhiyuktanam yoga kshema vahamya ham. 9.22 of Gita, Krishna says to those who are exclusively devoted to me, I give them what they lack and I preserve what they have. So Krishna actually gave what the devatas lacked 
At that point, the devatas like Swargaloka. So he gave it to them. But, he, but did they lose their devotion to him? No. This is a practical example of how we never lose Prabhus and Matajis if we put Krishna in the center. So my humble request is, from tomorrow, let Krishna be your employer. Students, children, if you go to school, you should ask yourself, who am I really studying for? I'm studying for Krishna. If you say, I'm studying for that teacher who's going to kill me, then you don't have any motivation. I'm studying for my parents who will always say it's not good enough, no motivation. But if you say, I'm studying for Krishna, then your parents become happy, your teachers leave you alone, and everyone becomes happy. For those of you who go to work tomorrow, remember one point. In 5.10 of Bhagavad Gita, when you have time, you read it. Brahmani Adhaya Karmani. Krishna gives a secret to work. Every day, Adhaya means resign. Every day when you go into the, your workplace, you sign the employment contract with Krishna as your boss. And you be conscious and begin your day knowing who is your boss. Your conscience will never allow you to do work that is any less. Because you have the best employee in the whole universe. At the end of the day, you resign from your work. And you say, Krishna, whatever that I've done for today is now yours. I resigned. And when you come home, be peaceful. And know in your conscience that you have given it your best. This is Krishna consciousness. Hare Krishna. I can take one question, if there is any question around that you have. Uh, I have one yes, Prabhu. When, uh, when this journey took place, ah, yes. at that time, uh, Lord Shiva took uh, poison. Yeah, That's why his neck is... Uh, Neela so, so only this part, if you can just... Sure, sure. In fact, it's very nice. Thank you for telling me that. The first thing that came out is the journey when was this terrible poison. And when this poison came out, it was so powerful that the devatas were going to die, the demons were going to die. And Vasuki was also going. So, they didn't know what to do. And at that point, Lord Vishnu says, Lord Shiva is compassion personified. And only he has the capacity to drink this poison. You go to him. And Bhagavatam shows very nicely how they go to Lord Shiva. And when Lord Shiva sees that they are in so much trouble, Lord Shiva is known as Asutosh. He's one who's very easily pleased because he's very compassionate. Because he has this great quality of compassion, he decided that he will drink this poison. But because he's so powerful a personality, by drinking the poison, the poison did not have to go completely into him for it to be completely taken out from the ocean of milk. So the whole poison remained in his neck and him being a divine <laughs> powerful personality, it never affected his consciousness. But the poison would have affected the consciousness of the demons and the devatas. And so Lord Shiva served them as a true, true great personality so that they could continue in the process of finally ending this pastime. And that is why Bhagavatam says he is known as one who is dark or blue throat. Neela Kanta. Thank you Prabhu. It's a nice pastime. Yes. Yes. You know, in uh, Thailand, uh, Swan Bumi is. Yeah, you see that whole beautiful. Uh, beauty view is so nice. This yeah. one is a real example. You know, the it is. It shows the, beautiful the uh, influence of Vedic culture. Yeah. You have seen that this entire pastime is seen in Suvarna Bumi airport in Thailand, actually. Yeah. And the, the facial expressions, the. Very the, nice. the, the, the it, it's very accurate based on what Bhagavatam gives. It's very accurate. You have a question. Last question. How do, you do, uh, how do you devote everything uh, like to Krishna? How do you know what he wants us to do? Very good question. How do you know what he wants us to do? You will start to know what he wants us to do if you read the Gita or you have someone read it with you. Then you will know that actually what Krishna wants is that he doesn't want what he doesn't really want what you like. He's not interested because whatever you have actually belongs to him. You know, you're having something because of his mercy. But what he likes is for you not to forget that whatever you have actually came from him. That is what he really feels. So if you really know that whatever I have is actually coming from my Supreme Father, Krishna becomes very pleased. If you have that in mind, in anything you take up, 
and you always thank him for what comes to you, he becomes very satisfied. And then whatever you do, you also become protected. You don't get touched. You try this. It's a very simple but very beautiful way to build a loving relationship with Krishna. It's like you get a nice toy. What should you do? You should put it before Krishna and say, Krishna, thank you. You must, of course, thank the person who gave you a toy. Otherwise, you don't get another toy. <laughs> thank those who give it to you. But after thanking them, you should know that they are also instruments in Krishna's hands. Krishna is giving you something through someone. When your father or mother tells you to do something, and they say it's for your good, they are your parents. You must respect them. If you want to respect them more, you must also understand, Krishna is telling me this good advice through my parents. Thank you, Krishna. If you do that from your age now till the day you leave this world, you will never, never be unhappy in any situation. It's a very good question. Okay? Shall we chant Krishna's names for five minutes? Are we okay, Prabhu, to chant? No? Anyone very hungry? Can you tolerate Prabhu? You are? Okay, you go. <laughs> the rest have to stay here. Yeah. At least he's honest, you know? Honestly, it's best policy. So now we are going to chant Krishna's names. And when we chant Prabhu and Mataji's, can I request you to chant with this mood in the context of the verse today? Chant for his satisfaction. Chant for his pleasure. When you chant for his pleasure, the pleasure automatically comes to you. It's a small difference, but it's all the difference. It's all the difference. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna.
The unborn child is supremely conscious of his or her position. Bhagavatam is very clear. And I would request you to read the unborn child's prayers. And these prayers are so powerful. We all chanted these prayers in Bhagavatam. But we have forgotten them somehow. But now, know with faith that whatever we have spoken today, whatever that we have chanted today, the unborn child can hear, can perceive, and can receive. If you both have this nice mood of Krishna consciousness, the child will be born blessed with spiritual life. So many millions of lives we had, and so many lives we have forgotten. And so many times we are back. At least give one life for the satisfaction of Krishna. Can't hurt, isn't it? So many lives went, and everything went also with it. But this life, let's make use of this life. Let's change what we have. We don't have to delete everything. We just have to add Krishna. No deleting in Krishna consciousness. Just adding. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. 